Okay, hello, I'm Carolyn Benetton, Director of Public Affairs here at the Consulate General of Israel. And thank you, thank you for joining us for this year's national commemoration event on Jewish refugees from Arab lands and Iran. The ceremony today is hosted by both the Consulate General of Israel to the Pacific North and Southwest. And we'd also like to take this time to thank our wonderful partners for all of their support for today's ceremony. And now, please welcome the Consul General of Israel to the Pacific Southwest, Dr. Hillel Newman. Hi there, one second. Hi there, can you all hear me? Yes. I'd like to uh, open up with uh, greetings uh, to all the uh, spectators and all the participants. Uh, special thanks to the Consulate General in San Francisco that has partnered with us and uh, acknowledgments to our partners, uh, Jamena, Iranian American Federation, 30 years after the Hillels, Club Z, Camera and others who have joined. Um, of course, special acknowledgement also to the speakers and moderator, Dr. Sharon Nazarian, Mr. Avram Sofer, and our moderator, dear David Suisa. Um, I'm just opening with a few words of greeting, and I'd like to mention that, you know, throughout history, uh, Jews lived in different periods under Muslim rule. And there were, there were good times. Although they were always regarded as second-class citizens, they did receive a safe sanctuary under Muslim rule during difficult periods like the Inquisition. But there were also very bad times. And the bad times were when uh, Islam was politicized, especially between the years of 1948 and 1972. And we are marking in this event uh, the plight of those Jews that had to leave, were forced to leave. And we're talking about a scope of uh, more than 850,000 Jews who had to flee, flee from Arab states and Iran more than $150 billion of assets that were lost, possessions that were lost. And uh, overnight, sometimes they had to flee with uh, one suitcase. That is the plight of the Jews from Arab lands when we talk about countries like Algeria, Egypt, Iraq, Libya, Morocco, Syria, Tunisia, Yemen, and of course, Iran. Many, of course, were also murdered uh, before they left, before they could even uh, leave. And uh, there is, what I'm trying to mention is that there is a friendly Islam that Israel and the Jews can live with, but there is also a politicized Islam. And I myself served as ambassador of Israel to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, two Muslim states. And I witnessed firsthand how there is a friendly Islam that Israel and the Jews can live with in peace and coexistence. Just this week, we have seen how uh, an Egyptian singer uh, uh, dared to take a photograph together with an Israeli singer, Omer Adam. And when he returned to Egypt, he was penalized and he was ostracized and persecuted for just taking a picture with an Israeli singer. And on the other hand, that Israeli singer, Omer Adam, was invited to Dubai and uh, had public performances. What I'm saying is that we must all try and find the ways to work together and live in coexistence, but we must remember the past. We must try and avoid the past, and we must also speak out against politicized Islam. I will just finish with remembering one person. His name is Habib El Khanian. He was executed on May 9th, 1979 in Iran after a 20 minute trial. Uh, this, this man should be remembered just like all the others that died or lost their possessions or uh, suffered difficulty due to uh, the oppression under Islamic rule. Thank you very much. Thank you, Consul General. And now please welcome Consul General of Israel to the Pacific Northwest, Shlomi Kaufman. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, <clears throat> for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, and thank you for all to all the partners that um, that join us uh, for you know to commemorate and and uh, have this event uh, happening and um, and making all the efforts uh, to to be with us. I also want to welcome and and be grateful to to express my gratitude to to California elected officials officials from Jewish Caucus to this event, Senator Herzberg and Senator Becker, 
Welcome and happy to have you uh, with us today. This event, ladies and gentlemen, is a very important for me personally because it is a unique opportunity to dive into a part of history, to listen to stories, which, which is little known to uh, many of us, and especially to younger audience uh, who join us today. It is an opportunity to learn about flourishing Jewish communities, 2,500 years old, that thrived in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, and Iraq. Communities that enjoyed limited, although, but opportunities for investment in society, in education, religion, and business. Some of the most important literary and artworks were created in these communities. It is also an opportunity to learn what happened to these communities in the 20th century, how classic and modern European anti-Semitism penetrated to Arab lands and created a massive wave of almost 1 million refugees losing everything they had. The story of migration of almost 1 million refugees is part of the establishing of the state of Israel, is part of Israel today, and it is part of the Jewish history today. The story needs to be told and retold. And this is why we're all here today. Thank you so much for taking the time and let's listen to the stories. Thank you, Consul General. And now to our program and a quick reminder, please feel free to submit questions at any point during our panel in the chat. And now we're so fortunate today to have as our moderator, the editor in chief of the Jewish Journal, please welcome David Suisa. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you to the esteemed audience. <clears throat> As a Jew who was born in Casablanca, uh, I got to tell you, this is a special day for me. And I know uh, that this is a relatively recent tradition to create this special day for refugees who come from um, Arab countries, including Iran. So I have a special connection with this event. Uh, I have two great panelists that I will now introduce. My friend Sharon Nazarian. Dr. Nazarian was born in Tehran, Iran. During the Iranian Revolution of 1979, she immigrated to the United States, settling in Beverly Hills. Since 2017, Sharon has served as the Senior Vice President for International Affairs for the Anti-Defamation League, taking the responsibility of fighting anti-Semitism and racial hatred around the globe, including overseeing ADL's Israel office. We also have Abraham David Sofer, who was born in Bombay, India, to an Iraqi Jewish family who left Iraq in the late 19th century. He is a former United States district judge and former legal advisor to the United States State Department. He is a George Shultz Senior Fellow in Foreign Policy and National Security Affairs at the Hoover Institute at Stanford U University. Welcome to my esteemed panelists. Thank you, David. Uh, and Abraham, can I start with you? Because it's interesting because you were born and raised in India, which is not really a, an Arab or Muslim or you don't have that typical Mizrahi thing. However, your family is, is Mizrahi. What was it like to be an Iraqi Jew in India? It was wonderful, David. Uh, thank you very much. Um, India was a haven uh, for many Iraqi Jews and many other kinds of Jews, even before us. Um, when the... Uh, the Iraqi community, of course, as you said, was a great community. Uh, Bavli was the place where the Babylonian Talmud was written and the great schools uh, of Jewish study uh, were created there. Uh, and we've been there since uh, 586 BC, the first exile. Uh, so it's an old community, uh, but um, many times family sent members for one reason or another to other countries. And uh, I was part, on both sides of my family, part of a migration from Iraq to India and Burma 
my father's family moved to Rangoon in the late 19th century because of Dawood Pasha, who was a particularly egregious and horrible uh, Turkish, Ottoman Turkish uh, governor. Uh, but we grew up in the most wonderful community in Bombay. The Sassoons had built a great infrastructure, synagogues, hospitals, libraries, uh, and we had Habonim, we had Maccabi, we had, um, and once Israel was created, we had uh, many uh, of us uh, went to Israel, got trained and came back and taught uh, the kids, who I was one of the kids, uh, about Israel and about being Jewish. And we had a beautiful synagogue, of course, it's still there. It was just renovated in Bombay. So what I could tell you, it was as, as I thought it had existed forever as a child because it was so ideal. Uh, but little did I know it had only existed at, at that time for about 70 years. So it was quite a new uh, community, but well, very well established. You know, what blows me away is whenever I meet uh, Iranian friends, Jewish friends in Los Angeles, and we look back on our past. So my father was a teacher at Ort in Casablanca and my Iranian friends, they also talk about Ort. So they, we had these institutions that kept us connected without us knowing it. And I think the Zionist story was very much part of that. Sharon, I want to I wanna ask you a question. You and I have known each other for a long time. I've never asked you this. Um, did your family feel real fear while they were living in Tehran? First of all, thanks for having me, David. I'm so glad that there is this commemoration now on the calendar, on all our Jewish calendars, and hopefully global calendars, to really commemorate the plight of refugees who lost their homeland um, and being forced into exile just for being Jewish. So this is a very important commemoration today, and uh, I hope that we continue to uh, keep remembering uh, all the families who lost um, their assets, their homes, everything they had built. And my family, David, is very similar to that. Um, I think as, as many of us who have lived in the diaspora know, when you're a member of a minority community, whether there's outward fear in your daily life because you're a minority, or if it's purely something in your subconscious where you're taught as a child when you're walking in the street, when you're in the company of others, and we all know what the others are, how do you speak? What tone do you use? So whether it's conscious or subconscious, there was fear. There was fear that was bred into us um, as Jews, as children. And, and uh, so history of Iranian Jewry went from periods of systemic oppression and, and um, discrimination and to periods of tolerance. Uh, but that is in our DNA and the in a kind of communal DNA of Iranian Jewry was one that was always be fearful of the Muslims because they hated us. They considered us najes, which is impure. Um, and you know, if you take just the lifetime of my father who will be turning 90, uh, hopefully next month, he really lived kind of the arc of the life of Iranian Jews where he was born at a time in 1931 where Iranian Jews were limited to uh, living in ghettos, to actual legal ghettos. Um, in, in very poor parts of the city. And through the arc of his life, he went through a period of the oil boom and the creation of the state of Israel and his ability to become a major businessman. So there was much more tolerance for Jews in Iran. And then came the revolution in 1978 or 1979 where all that was taken away. So literally in one lifetime, you can see the arc of the life of Jews in Iran um, and what we have experienced over 2,700 years repeated in a very short amount of time. Well, thank you, Sharon. Uh, Abraham, there's an interesting paradox whenever I consider the idea of Jewish refugees, because on the one hand, the idea of being refugee has a real negative connotation in today's world, especially when you see the extreme case of the refugees from Syria and so forth. And yet, as a refugee myself, I was never raised by my parents to see my refugee status as any kind of negative. I was never raised as a victim. Um, and it's interesting when I see 
you know, my panelists today, you've accomplished so much, you know, as refugees. And I wonder if that goes through your mind, Abraham, uh, in terms of how you feel about your refugee status here in America. I'm very grateful to America. It depends on where you go, David, a lot. Mm -hmm. We're very lucky to be in this wonderful country. My cousins who grew up in Baghdad, uh, with whom we stayed very closely in touch, they suffered in the Farhud and they had to run away from Baghdad. Uh, they moved into our apartment in Bombay, in fact, my two cousins. When they came to America, finally, they hardly spoke English. They spoke French and Arabic, uh, uh, but they didn't speak English. But they became professors at MIT. Uh, wow. One was a laser scientist, another was a, a fluid dynamics. Incredible people. And it, you just had to have the opportunity. And of course, Israel became a really massive uh, place for Iraqi Jews to find opportunity. And uh, uh, it's a great blessing uh, that Israel was there uh, for all the uh, Arab uh, Jews from Arab countries to, to find a home uh, and, and to thrive in. Today, there's a half a million Iraqi Jews in Israel. So it's, it's, a, great, it's a great thing. Uh, it's wonderful to remember what Sharon said, what, what our people went through, uh, being uh, exiled, pushed out, uh, deprived of all their assets. It's also wonderful to remember that uh, we're in good places now and uh, our communities are thriving. Uh, Sharon, is there, I know that with my mother, no matter how successful she became in Canada, because we moved to Canada in the mid 60s, we went from the, the Mediterranean to the North Pole, if you don't mind. And it was a real culture shock, tremendous amount of hardships and suffering because of the, the winters. Uh, but eventually, you know, like Abraham was saying, you know, we really succeeded. And yet having said all that, there is a certain nostalgia for the old country. As much as the part of my family that moved to Israel and is very happy in Israel, the part of my family that moved to Canada and me in America, we're all very happy. There's a cer certain nostalgia. I think in the case of Morocco, it was the, the desert and the ocean, the protection of the king and the, 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 the culture, the music. I tell my Ashkenazi friends, if they ever come to one of our weddings, half of the music is in Arabic. It's Arabic music. So there, there is that sense. I wonder if it's the same with both of you and Sharon. Is there a certain nostalgia for the old country? I would say absolutely. And it's actually a really interesting story. When you speak with Iranian, non-Jewish Iranians, they actually credit the Jewish Iranian community in the diaspora for maintaining not only the language and the culture and the history. So Jewish Iranians have really kind of uh, not only embraced, but made sure to pass on um, all those cultural norms to their children. And if you speak to any Iranian in Los Angeles that is Jewish, there's a very high chance that their children who were born here, who are even young today, they might be teenagers, they will speak fluent Farsi, they will be listening to, you know, Persian pop songs, either coming out of LA or um, other parts of the world. And uh, that nostalgia really translates into daily lives where our, uh, the kitchens, all the food is still being prepared. And there's a real, um, you know, there's a real sense of pride in the fact that we have been able to not only not lose the identity, but in fact, embellish it and even make it stronger. So it's a real, the, again, it attests to the fact that our sense of um, cultural strength is, is really there and we didn't want to lose it. And it's still there, you know, 40 years later. And one of the things I find fascinating by uh, living in America, I feel we're part of this grand family reunion where there's a real interchange among the cultures. My synagogue on Pico is Moroccan, Iraqi, Syrian, and Persian. And all during the high holidays, we always get into the debates, which, uh, which melodies are going to prevail. 
okay. each year and my contingent, I want my Moroccan melodies and my Iraqi friends want their melodies and Syrians as well. And it's, it's all in good humor, uh, but there's really, I think we, we can't um, overstate the value of this, of this interchange of cultures where you see now some uh, Iranian Jews that are you know, becoming more like Chabad and more religious and they're taking in some Ashkenazi influences. And there are Ashkenazi Jews in my neighborhood that are embracing Sephardic traditions, especially some Sephardic uh, nigunim. So I, I find that, I don't know if you're seeing that where you are, Abraham, but I think it's a distinct and fascinating notion of modern day American Jewry. Absolutely, uh, but you have to remember that um, it, Iraqi culture it was not just Muslim culture, it was also Jewish culture. Uh, we were 25% of the population of Baghdad. We were uh, accountants, musicians, uh, tremendously active in music, incidentally, in, in, in Arabic music. And so, of course, we, we have a wonderful memory of that because we were part of it. We created it with the Muslims. And uh, we had these periods, as you said, periods where uh, Arab nationalism took over and they became uh, uh, very anti-Semitic. Um, and there were periods even earlier where that happened. But generally speaking, we were part of the cultures in the Middle East and we helped create them and they're rich and they're wonderful. And of course we long for brotherhood and sisterhood uh, with all those people that we we are we were part of, and um, and maybe uh, the trend that has just happened, where Arabic countries are reaching out to Israel, uh, could could be the the beginning of something really great. You know, I've often said that I grew up, I never heard about the Holocaust until I met an Ashkenazi Jew in Montreal. <laughs> And there was a Sephardic rabbi in New York called Mark Angel, who did a video for us once on the Judaism of the sun, as opposed to the Judaism of winter. And, and I have to say that really resonates with me because we had a, there was an event in LA last year where the, the king brought a delegation and his sister was there. And I thanked him because the Judaism that I picked up in Morocco was what I call the Judaism of the sun, the Judaism of optimism. And despite the fact that we lived in a Muslim country, because we accepted our roles as second-class citizens, as dhimis, they allowed us to practice our Judaism in the same way that you practice your Judaism in Iraq. I'm not sure to what extent that was true in, uh, in Tehran, but I will ask you in a minute, Sharon. But I, I have to tell you, one of the great gifts that I got, that we got from Morocco, is we were able to create our own Judaism of optimism. Sharon, what was the practice of Judaism like in Tehran? Well, uh, I think it was very similar to Jewish life in many Arab, Arab uh, capitals and, and Arab cities where we had the synagogues. Um, and again, I can speak for my generation, obviously, as, as Abraham said, there were periods of intolerance and we even had pogroms in Iran where there was outright slaughter of Jews, historically speaking. Um, but in my, my time, uh, we had Jewish day schools, we had multiple, many, many synagogues in Tehran. Um, but there was the feeling also that we had to always be mindful. We always had to be careful. Um, and that essentially we felt uh, that we're a community that could be attacked for no reason at all. Um, I think during the 60s and 70s especially, there was a period of real trust and comfort where the Jewish community for the first time felt protected. Um, again, because of economic uh, improvement in, uh, in Iran's overall economy, because of the oil boom, many Iranian families flourished. So they were able to move into better parts of the, uh, of the city, um, buy more beautiful homes, have more businesses. And their Judaism also increased with that and, and flourished with that. So there was more sense of security. Um, but I would say overall, again, the feeling that if you went to a home of a Muslim neighbor, 
Um, you are not allowed to eat. You are not allowed to touch the dishes. Um, the feeling that uh, if you are in a, a gathering with non-Muslims that you shouldn't be vociferously really voicing your negative opinion. Um, all these things were very much um, in our DNA as Jews. And in terms of our practice of Judaism, it was within our homes, it was a private matter, um, and it was within the community. It was nothing that could be made public in that way. Got it. Uh, well, I want to, first of all, congratulate the organizers of this event because you are incorporating music in the event. And what I'm about to introduce is not a musical break. It is integral to this whole event because of everything we talk about, music is integral to how we express our, our culture and so forth. So I'm very honored to introduce Tai Chaim, who's going to play some beautiful music for us. And feel free to put all your questions together and Caroline will share them with me and we'll continue the program right after the music. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Do you guys hear me well? Oh yes. We're very excited to be here with you um, from Tel Aviv, sending love. I'm Tair, this is Michael on the guitar. We've been touring together and playing all over the world before the pandemic. And uh, we're happy to be here. Um, so if you don't know me, I'm, um, I'm the founder and lead singer of the group Ewa that mixes Yemenite music uh, with modern beats. And currently I'm working on my solo project and Zooming with you guys. So <laughs> I will begin with um, a song that um, I really love from the Jewish Yemenite tradition. Uh, it's called Ayala Thahen. And it was written by the great poet Shalom Shabazi in the 17th, 17th century. Um, and it talks about the strong connection between God and the people of Israel, even in the hard times um, in exile. So, Ayala <laughs> Khen. Oh, 
Love of my heart. It's the famous hit uh, of, um, of Ewa um, that we've been playing all over the world and rocking <laughs> with this song. Um, and it's actually um, a women's song. Uh, women back then in Yemen didn't know how to read and write. There was a lack of education for women. And uh, they just created songs and passed it down from one woman to another. And when the Yemenite Jews came to Israel, um, they started recording these beautiful songs and beautiful culture that women created. Um, so one day I had this idea to record with my sisters of, of Ewa this beautiful song and give it um, our own modern twist. Habib Galbi Moyaini, love of my heart and my eyes, who turned you against me? Habib Bakal Ayani, Mabish Makala Habib Zani. La 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 
Thank you, guys. That was so beautiful. And Thank you, David. <laughs> yeah, you know, I that first song you sang, we sing it on Shabbat for the Rori Kra. Oh, amazing. So it's a I love that. And I have to tell you that as I was hearing you perform, it, 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 it dawned on me how amazing it is that we're able to live at a time when this kind of music is being played throughout Israel and even here in the Jewish communities of America. And we can't take those things for granted because for, many, right. of Ash, yeah. for many of my Ashkenazi friends, they never heard this. And there's so much music I hear from my Ashkenazi friends that my ancestors never got to hear. So uh, I'm very grateful that this has been included in it. And before we go to audience questions, I want to ask my two panelists what went through their mind as they were listening to this music. I'll start with, you know, a, a, an academic and a scholar speaking about music. Abraham, what were you thinking while you were hearing the music? Uh, I was thinking that if you if it were if it were not in Hebrew, we, we would think it was Egyptian or Moroccan or Iraqi. It's a marvelous thing. And uh, the wonderful thing about the Jews of Israel is that they, we, we are so varied and we've brought so many one, uh, great cultures to bear in, in this one uh, great uh, civilization. Sharon, what went through your mind as you were listening? I was just thinking how strong is our Jewish spirit and how lovely it is that it's represented in, you know, no matter what our history continues to live on through wonderful, wonderful um, uh, artists like Tayyir and bravo to you for doing this and taking this message around the world. We're so privileged to have ambassadors like such as yourself and, and how, what a beautiful sound and what a beautiful culture to continue to keep alive. Thank you for doing uh, that. It, it reminded me of how this idea of interchange in the same way that the Jews have given so much to their diaspora communities over 1900 years. In the same way, we've also received so much. And these musical influences that we are now, like my favorite Shabbat song is, Sephardic song is Ki Esmera Shabbat, the Moroccan version. Please don't ask me to sing, but it's got Arab roots that we've made Jewish to honor the Shabbat. So on that note, I'd like to give our audience a chance to ask questions, Carolyn. If you would like to pick a few questions from the audience. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have one question, which I think is interesting. Which uh, Mizrahi piece of literature, music, film, or art would you recommend that we look at during this time? Great question. Abraham. Well, uh, that's really a tough one, uh, but um, the Babylonian Talmud is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, that's Jew very Jewish. Um, I'd say uh, Arabic music is um, is the most the most important part of uh, my life growing up. We had childries at home. We had dancing. We had uh, and and uh, we were very very Jewish. But um, the the music really does continue to haunt us. And I would I would work. I'd focus on the music. Carolyn, I have a specific, my mind went all over the place, but I have a specific recommendation, which I think is really apt for this event, given that this is being put together with by Jimena, which I have such a great respect for, by the way, David. I want to make sure Jimena is recognized here. The amazing work of this organization, Sarah Levin as its director, for doing what we all know is needed. And they're out there every day, not only um, uh, advocating on behalf of uh, uh, Mizrahi Jews, educating, so really kudos to them for the work that they do every day, but also because this is being put on by the Israeli consulate. So a movie that came out, I think about, I don't know, four or five years ago called Baba Jun. Baba Jun in Farsi means father, dear father. It was a very unique historical first. That was an Israeli made movie written by an Iranian Israeli 
uh, Yuval um, Dalshad. And it was mostly in Farsi, about three generations of Iranian Israelis living in Israel. But with all the history and culture and trauma of the Iranianness of the parent uh, generation being brought into Israel and what it's meant for refugees from Iran who came to Israel. So it's a very beautiful, touching, almost universal theme, but brings together Iranian culture, Jewish Iranian culture, Israel, and being part of the diaspora, and the uh, Olim who actually made Aliyah to Israel. So I think it's a very specific movie that I think everybody will, will resonate with everyone. And someone's asking if you could repeat the name of the movie one more time. It's called Baba, B-A-B-A, Jun, J-O-O-N, which in Farsi means dear. Baba is father and Jun dear. It's really a lovely movie. I think you will enjoy it. David, did you want to say something? Yeah, Caroline, if I can pick up from uh, what Sharon was saying, you know, we have grandchildren in our family in LA and they're completely disconnected from their past. And I've been using YouTube with them a lot. And you, YouTube is absolutely miraculous. I will type in Moroccan Jewish music. I will type in any great Moroccan Jewish singer and it's kind of, we take it for granted now, but it's unbelievable. I want to encourage all the guests, if you have any interest in learning about any of this, you will be pleasantly surprised by putting in stuff on YouTube and you'll get the greatest documentaries. I have seen Jews and Muslims praying in a mosque in Isawira with beautiful music and on and on and on, whether it's with Iraqi Jews or Syrian Jews, or Iranian Jews. Uh, so I want to encourage all of you to really use that modern day miraculous instrument. We have a question here, jumping off of what you were saying, uh, Sharon, that the Jerusalem Post is from Gina. The Jerusalem Post today gives some credit to Mizrahi Jews for opening the door to the Gulf states. Can you comment on the contribution Jimena continues to make towards peace with some Middle East countries? I, mean, I really don't want to speak on behalf of Jimena. I think I, that's not fair for me to speak on behalf of them. But I do think, even if you look at the diplomatic core of Israel today, even if you look at all this, like people like yourself, Carolyn, but those who came from Arab lands, the familiarity with language, with culture, we all know that what has happened in the last few months, which has been so historic, the ground has been laid for years and years and years. This was not just something the... the uh, uh, peace treaty with Bahrain and with UAE. This didn't just happen overnight. And I think that whether it is Jews in the diaspora who came from those lands, who spoke the Arabic language, who understood the culture, there's something to be said for that. Um, we knew the threat, but we also know the culture and language. So again, I don't want to speak specifically for what the contributions of the Mizrahi diaspora community has been to the changing of the shifting sands in the Middle East, but there's definitely something there and the familiarity and knowing uh, one another um, contributes to that, I would say. Uh, we have another question. Uh, could you please share the story of the day you realized that you were turning into a refugee? Did it happen overnight? Do you know what happened to your home in Iraq, in Iran? Did you or your family members ever visit since? Abraham, have you? Well, I was never really a refugee in that sense. Uh, my grandparents, my great grandparents on both sides were refugees. And, but um, I did, I, I was in schools all over the world as a young boy, and I have experienced that, but I, I experienced it through my cousins. And my uncle in Bombay who went to Iraq and was killed trying to get our property back uh, near Kirkuk. Uh, these are things that, uh, you know, you do experience as being part of an Iraqi family. And Carolyn, for us, it was pretty uh, abrupt, you know, and starting in 1978, where we saw um, demonstrations increase on the cities of Tehran, where we lived, where on the way to school, I remember my father telling me, you know, when I'm at school, I went to a Jewish day school, not to sit next to the window because our uh, school, Etefaq, I was across the street from the university. Um, and that's where a lot of the demonstrations were, you know, was an active hot point. And he said, don't sit next to the window because they'll probably throw rocks at you. So the, the momentum behind the revolution was very rapid and quick. Um, and we had to leave specifically because, and I'll tell you again, it's very momentous that we're having this with the consulate. 
it was the ambassador, Israeli ambassador to Iran, who came to my father and said, you need to leave. The situation is very bad. We don't see it getting better and your lives are in danger. My father worked very closely with the, both with Israeli government, with many Israeli companies. And uh, we were warned and we literally had to leave with, with our luggage. So it was a very abrupt leaving, but we also thought we we're gonna come back. For those of you who know Iranian history, you know this was not the first time that the Shah had abdicated throne in the 1950s, the same thing had happened. So we went to Tel Aviv again. We left Iran for Tel Aviv, hoping that we will come back because we were so sure that the US government would not allow uh, the Shah to be toppled in the way that actually did happen. So um, we went left thinking we will come back and unfortunately we did not. 40 years later, we have never been back. And I think some of the questions were asking whether I've been back, I am really in forced exile. I am not allowed to go back to the country where I was born. So we have to come to the end of our questions and we do have a question. We have a lot of students here with us today. And what is your personal message to our students who are here today? Anyone can, can start. Go ahead, Abraham, you go first. Well, I think the, the, uh, the message of the day is to remember. I mean, that's our basic message as Jews is uh, to keep a memory, um, learn what happened uh, to these 800,000 uh, that were forced out of uh, places they had lived, lived in for 1,500 to 2,000 years. Um, and, how, and be grateful for the fact that they had a place to go to uh, that is now a great country, a small but wonderful country. And I would share, Carolyn, that, you know, at my work at ADL now, um, what I've come to learn is, yes, we need to know the history, but we have to also continue our, our advocacy and we have to continue fighting um, the, the battles that we have in front of us. And the Islamic Republic of Iran continues to be the number one state sponsor of anti-Semitism, of Holocaust denial. So the regime is there and we have to be knowledgeable. We have to be really aware of the pernicious effect of, uh, the pernicious effect of this regime, not only you know, in, in, to its own citizens, Jews still living in Iran, they're still paying the price for being um, second-class citizens, not only to the region, the threat it poses to, to Israel. Look what just happened over the weekend in terms of uh, the assassination of the head of the nuclear um, authority of Iran. And now all the Jews around the world are literally living in fear. Will this regime take revenge on the Jewish community? We're all living with that fear right now. And then, but also Iran's pernicious effect around the world in Latin America, through Hezbollah, through others. So we have to be on our guard. We have to be really, you know, not become complacent and the history that we've lived continues today. So um, that's why I'm at ADL, given my life story. And I think many of us who've had to leave our homes and, and lose uh, everything we had, realize that we have to continue fighting on. So let's, let's keep at it. Thank you. And uh, now we are going to once again have another wonderful performance from Te'ir. Okay, thank you again. So our next song will be um, the first single um, of my solo project that I released this year. Um, and I, I wrote a lot of songs about the story of, of immigration of my grandparents from Yemen to Israel. But this one is from my perspective um, singing in, in the Yemenite Arabic dialect, sometimes I feel that I, I'm not so easy to digest. And I talk about it in the song and I say that um, um, I come with the Yemenite groove, the Yemenite thrill, and this is me. Um, so this is Mit Bashelet Le'at, Simmer Slowly. I also talk about living uh, about me simmer slowly in a world um, that goes so fast and uh, everything is so instant. Um, all right, so hope you'll enjoy it. Yeah. 
אני מתרשלת לאט, כמו המין של שבת, בעולם של אינסטנט, אני מתרשלת לאט, אני מתרשלת לאט, כמו המין של שבת, בעולם של אינסטנט, אני מתרשלת לאט. so much thank you and now um, for the last song oh you wanted to say anything no 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 oh okay <laughs> um, so we are very thankful uh, being here with all of you today I mean thank God for zoom it's totally changed our lives because <laughs> um, you know we've been touring the world and And, um, you know, I went with my Yemenite music and groove um, almost everywhere and being able to, to still um, play for you guys, it's, it's amazing. So we are sending you lots of love from Tel Aviv. It's, um, for us, it's, uh, it's almost 11 now. Yeah. It's pretty late. Um, and this is the last song. I wanted to finish off with something really positive because 2020 has been um, a crazy year for each and every one of us. Um, so I thought maybe a song that brings the jama'a, brings everybody, the people together um, for celebration of life, for joy. thanking God and thanking the people that we love um, for our existence. Um, so this one is Jama. It's uh, in Yemenite Arabic. Um, enjoy it. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to the Israeli consulate in San Francisco and in LA and 
um, and all of you, all the, the great uh, team um, and everyone who's watching us. I'm Tahir, this is Michael Meital. Thank you. Thank you. Much love and take care, everyone. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. We would just like to take these uh, final few minutes. And if each of our uh, participants, David, Abraham, Sharon, uh, just take a couple seconds for a final thought. OK. David? Oh, I can start. Well, I love the last <laughs> question, which is if I had a message to students, or in fact, to everyone who's watching, who has a Mizrahi background, or even who doesn't. Uh, the greatest gift in my life, the, the gift that has kept me going through thick and thin, through all the hardships and all the ups and downs, was my sense of curiosity. And it's one of the least discussed attributes, and I want to encourage everyone 
to kind of ignite your curiosity gene. If you're an Ashkenazi Jew watching this, find out about the Mizrahi experience and vice versa. Uh, I think the, the history of the Jews and the stories of the Jews never ceases to amaze me, uh, especially since the destruction of the temple in the year 70 to the Holocaust. I think those years are the most fascinating years for me because so much of Jewish history has been taken over by the Holocaust and by the incredible miraculous state of Israel. I just want to encourage everybody to, you know, go back and see the fascinating stories of our people, the hardships they went through, and this miraculous ability to survive century after century and still be able to leave us with the kind of legacy that we can discuss today. Thank you, David. And Abraham, we have just a few more seconds. I would, I would follow up with David, uh, what David said, and I would urge people, uh, young people, to study the difference between the Holocaust and the way Israel brought in 800,000 Jews from the Middle East. The, the, the amazing difference that we had a country uh, that had the capacity to save Jews in a crisis like that uh, and the details of it, how much was done by a state that had just begun, that had hardly any resources, and yet gathered their strength and went out there and somehow managed, with the help of American Jews and other Jews in the diaspora, managed to save a Middle Eastern Jewry. Great, a great, a great story. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Sharon unfortunately had to rush to something. We thank her very much for her participation. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us. And this concludes our program today. We again wanna thank you so much for joining us for this very special and important event. And we wanna thank once again, our incredible panelists, our amazing moderator, our wonderful performer, and of course, our partners. And if you could just stay a few more minutes, we are going to end with a video of images from all of the communities we've talked about today. So thank you again for joining us and please stay safe.
ليش خليتيني بلاش ونموت بالهموم نهاو ليالي انا وانا اللي بكي تاليا عمري ما ننساك يرجعك